Okay, so we're going to start. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. Uh, this is a part of a web the webinar series of LAMSA, and tonight we're going to be talking about psychiatric disorders and pregnant women. Uh, my name is Kadim Erhayim. I am a I am 23 years old, and I am a fifth year or MS2 medical student at USG. Uh, I am a LAMSA ambassador for this year. I am also an editorial contributor for uh, USG's newspaper, and I am a published author with three books under my belt. Uh, why I chose this topic, it's a topic that interests me a lot, and I'm sure that it's a topic that's very taboo, that's not really talked about in our culture, and there are a lot of misconceptions surrounding it, so I hope you will enjoy it. And uh, please, uh, throughout the presentation, leave your, leave your mics muted, and if there are any questions, we're going, to, we're going to be talking about them at the end, so you can put them in the chat box. Uh, so before starting, uh, let's talk a bit about LAMSA. It's the Lebanese Association of Medical Services for Addiction. It is an NGO that's funded by Dr. Zena Hassaf Mkarzil. It's based on evidence-based education and awareness of addiction, mental health, co-occurring physical health, and well-being issues. It aims for the destigmatization of these diseases, the implementation of strategies to systematically screen individuals for addiction and behavior, and to promote a sustainable and healthy community. So uh, let's introduce our topic. Uh, we know that pregnancy or the imminent arrival of a child can lead to serious uh, uh, consequences on the woman's body, whether it's physiological, psychological, or social. And these changes can be considered as major stressors. So the perinatal period is a period of great vulnerability for psychiatric conditions. When we talk about psychiatric conditions of the pregnant uh, woman, we talk about a period known as the perinatal period. And this period extends from the conception of the embryo to the first year of the child. So any psychiatric condition that appears during that period can either be a, um, a new one that appears, or it could be a, uh, an aggravation of a pre-existent uh, psychiatric condition. When we talk about the perinatal period, it's divided between the pregnancy itself and what we call the postpartum. And the postpartum, we have many definitions of it. The DSM defines it as uh, four weeks after childbirth, childbirth, the WHO six weeks after childbirth, and the, uh, for postpartum depression, we can even go up to 12 months after childbirth. Uh, I know it's a very heavy topic to discuss, and there is a lot of medic medical information in it, so I'm going to try to uh, simplify it as much as possible, but because I know, I know that there are med many medical students among us, I'm going to put some medical information here and there. So, so this is the outline I'm going to be talking about, some generalities with the risk factors and the differential diagnosis. Then we're going to be talking about the three main uh, psychiatric uh, diseases of pregnant women, which are anxiety disorders with GAD, panic disorders, and OCD, depression, whether it's antenatal or postpartum, and finally, postpartum psychosis. So let's start with the risk factors and the differential diagnosis. When we talk about risk factors, we know that they, th they should be evaluated and screened as early as possible, and not only by psychiatrists. During the pregnancy, any healthcare worker should screen them, whether it's uh, the general practitioner, the OBGYN, the nurse, or the midwife. We know that there are three types of risk factors, psychiatric, gynecological, and obstetrical, and environmental risk factors. And the psychiatric risk, risk factors, an important one is past psychiatric disorders, but also substance abuse disorder, and mainly uh, abuse of alcohol. Then in gynecological and obstetrical risk factors, we could talk about the age of pregnancy, whether it's below 20 or above 35. If it's the first pregnancy of the woman, if it's a non-wanted pregnancy, if there is suspicion of malformation in the fetus, if the pregnancy is complicated by, let's say, uh, hypertension or diabetes, if the delivery is uh, hard, which is called uh, labor dystocia, and finally, if the child is premature. Environmental risk factors include a single mother with marital difficulties, if the socioeconomic level is poor, if there is a lot of precarity and social isolation, if there is a history of abuse in the childhood of the woman, and here cultural factors are very important, and this is important when we talk about immigrants especially, because we know that there are a lot of changes in the language, of, uh, in the traditions, especially the traditions surrounding the childbirth itself. Now, let's talk about differential diagnosis. In medicine, when we, have, when we are doubting of a pathology, we should always rule out pathologies that could mimic it. So here, when we talk about psychiatric uh, pathologies, we should distinguish non-psychiatric uh, uh, etiologies that, that could mimic it. For example, cerebral venous thrombosis or a blood clot in the brain, simplified, 
uh, substance intoxications or infections uh, like the infection of the endometrium or the muscle in the women's uterus. Now, the main differential diagnosis is what we call primary maternal preoccupations. It's a term that's been coined by uh, the English pedi uh, pediatrician Donald N. Winnicott. What are primary maternal preoccupations? It's a very normal situation in every uh, new mother uh, where the new mother will feel spe a special orientation towards the need of her newborn. So it's in low intensity and it's an, adapt an, it's an adaptive function uh, for the new mother to be able to take care of her newborn. So it's completely normal. It's a normal parenting process and it's not something pathological. It's just a new mother that's trying to take care of her baby so she could feel a bit of anxiety. She could feel a bit of stress because of it. Now, the first pathology that we're going to be talking about is anxiety disorders, and there are many types of them. And we're going to be talking first about generalized anxiety disorders. What is the definition of God? It's an excessive anxiety and worry that's occurring a lot during the past six months for a number of activities. This is a very broad uh, definition for the generalized anxiety disorder, but here we have to talk about uh, the ones that are targeting uh, perinatal periods. We know that 5 to 15% of women in the perinatal period are affected by God. And these preoccupations are direct, directly associated with the pregnancy in itself. The woman could fear physical modifications, risk of fetal malformations, a fear of even giving birth to the child and taking care of the newborn. This could lead to permanent fears, anxiety crisis, avoiding coping or reassurance, and obsessions and rituals and irritability. So it's, an, it's a disorder, but why could we qualify it a disorder? We see the fears, we, we see the anxiety crisis, but I said that in the uh, preoccupations that I mentioned a few minutes ago, we have kind of these symptoms at low intensity. Here, the disturbance is not attributed to the physiological effects of a substance, of a substance or another medical condition. So it's the differential diagnosis that I mentioned beforehand. And most importantly, this pathology should hinder the functioning of the, of the woman, or it should have a great impact on her life. So this is why I said beforehand that the, pre, uh, the, uh, the preoccupations have low intensity. Here, any psychiatric disorder has a great impact on the person, and this is what qualifies it as a disorder. So the second subgenre of uh, anxiety disorders is panic disorder. Very simply put, a panic disorder is the uh, recurrence of many panic attacks. In our everyday life, we hear the word panic attack, but we should define it. It has a definition. It's an intense surge of fear or intense discomfort that suddenly appears. It reaches its peaks within minutes, and it has many symptoms. We should have at least four symptoms. The person will, fear, uh, will feel as if they are going to die imminently. They could have chills, they could, have, they could experience dizziness, they can have heart palpitations, they will hyperventilate or breathe very fast, they can shake, they can have nausea. So, uh, sorry, uh, we know that uh, pregnancy has a variable effect actually, actually on panic disorders. If the panic disorder is usually mild, the pregnancy would, will actually help to ease it. But if a woman is, is suffering from a very intense panic disorder, the pregnancy will, will actually aggravate it. The third um, type of anxiety disorders we're going to be tackling is OCD or obsessive compulsive disorder. OCD is a term we use a lot in Lebanon. And I'm sure we've all heard, oh, I'm so OCD. OCD is not an adjective. The, the sentence does not even make sense. Oh, I'm so obsessive compulsive disorder. OCD is a disease. It's an illness, it's a psychiatric illness that has its diagnosis and treatment. One could say I'm, I'm really perfectionist, but OCD is not a, uh, an adjective. What's the, the definition of OCD? Simply put, it's the presence of obsessions, compulsions, or both. I'm not going to be reading the definition. I'm going to be explained very simply. What's an obsession? It's an intrusive thought. This is the key word. It's an intrusive thought that suddenly comes to the head of the person and they cannot shake it. It's often very irrational and they cannot shake it. It's here, it's stuck in their head and they don't know what to do about it. So in order to get rid of that obsession, there are the compulsions. It's an act that's, uh, that aims to reduce the anxiety or the discomfort of the obsession. The most common known OCD is the uh, the health OCD or uh, the cleaning OCD. So here the obsession would be that a person is just uh, doing their typical activities and suddenly an intrusive thought will be, if you don't wash your hands seven times right now, someone of your family will die. 
this is an obsession. They know that it's an irrational fear. Uh, it's an irrational fear and it's an, an irrational thought. It's not really real. Yet so they feel an intense discomfort because of it and they want to get rid of it. So in order to get rid of it, they will do the compulsions of washing their hands multiple times. Now, how to apply it to uh, the pregnancy? The pregnancy can either trigger a new OCD or ameliorate, or if the, uh, uh, in another case, it can ameliorate uh, the OCD during the pregnancy, but during the postpartum, it, it will actually aggravate and deteriorate it if it's pre-existent. And it's mainly uh, characterized by these intrusive thoughts I was talking about. But here, the intrusive thoughts are a bit dire. Why? Because the intrusive thoughts are defined by a fear of a mother hurting her child. The new mother will, fe will feel like her obsession is, I have to hurt my child. I have to do something bad to that child. And she will be terrified of it. So the, conse the consequences are dire. Because the mother, because she's fearing these obsessions and she fears that she will do a compulsion towards her child, she will cut the contact and it will have a very dire consequence on that relationship. But here, it, we should say that uh, and we should teach the mother that the sphere is completely irrational. There is no side of, of infanticide whatsoever. It's just an irrational fear. We should explain that, we should treat the pathology, and we should take care of the follow-up. Now, in general, anxiety disorders are really linked to obstetrical complications and developmental disorders. And like I just mentioned for OCG, it can have a lot of consequences on the relationship between the mother and her child. So here, there is treatment. Even if the woman is pregnant, there is treatment for these disorders. There is a, what we call a risk-benefit balance that should be made between the treatment and between the pathology. So we know that if a woman, uh, for example, have, has GAD while being pregnant, we know that general anxiety disorder is linked to a lot of complications. So why shouldn't we treat it? Why should we be leaving it untreated if it has more risks of malformations, of complications, etc.? Now. Let's tackle our second topic, which is depression. What is depression? We all say also in the Lebanese culture, I'm so depressed and I'm depressed, but it, it's, a, it's an illness, it's a psychiatric illness that has its diagnosis. Depression is defined by, we have nine symptoms and it's defined by five or more symptoms for more than two weeks uh, at a time. The two main symptoms of it that should be present are a depressed mood most of the day and, when we, and what we call anhedonia. Anhedonia is the feeling of a complete loss of interest in things that uh, once interested us. So for example, if someone really likes uh, movies, they would go to the, to the theater uh, every now and then, they go to the cinema, they would watch a movie, they would enjoy it. If suddenly they are feeling depressed or sad most of the time, and they don't even feel the need or the pleasure in going to the cinema, this is really, um, uh, th that really targets us towards depression. Other symptoms I could include are insomnia or hypersomnia, fatigue and loss of energy, and uh, suicidal thoughts or even attempts and behaviors. When we look at the definition of depression, we can see that there is what we call a peripartum onset, which is a peripartum or antenatal uh, depression. We're going to be talking about both. Let's start with antenatal depression. We know that antenatal depression or the depression that occurs while uh, during the pregnancy has a lot of negative effects on the fetus while in the womb, but even on the newborn later on. 16% of women have antenatal depression. And I would like to, uh, to point that out, that all of the numbers I've been citing during the presentations are practically quite high. Uh, between 100 women, you have 16 that have antenatal depression. It's a lot, and unfortunately, it goes uh, really underdiagnosed. Antenatal depression is associated with spontaneous abortion, preterm birth, bleeding, operative deliveries. So now we know that we should treat antenatal depression, but what's the problem? It's that we know that uh, antidepressant drugs work really well, but we cannot do a lot of studies on pregnant women that are taking uh, antidepressant drugs because ethically speaking, we cannot tell a woman, uh, hello, you are pregnant, please take this drug so I can uh, study the side effects of it on you and on your baby, it's unethical. So we don't, we're not really sure of the side effects of it. But what we know is that the antenatal depression in itself has a lot of uh, problems, uh, can have a lot of problems on the fetus. So for example, the depression can do what we call a dysregulation of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, which has a lot of dire consequences on the fetus. Uh, this axis is an axis that connects the brain to the adrenal glands that are near the kidney. So here we should ask ourselves, should we leave the depression untreated or should we treat uh, to avoid all of these uh, well-known side effects? Of, co of course, it should not be left untreated. 
Now, postpartum depression, it has uh, approximately the same uh, prevalence as antenatal depression from 10 to 16%. It depends on the country, on the socioeconomic levels and many other factors. And we know that in 50%, the depression starts either before or during the pregnancy and it has many variants. There are risk factors to uh, postpartum depression. And the main risk factor is the history of perinatal or non-perinatal depression. So if a woman is already depressed, it can even double the risk of postpartum depression. We could also cite stressful events and poor support, whether social or financial. Let's talk a bit about the pathogenesis of postpartum depression or how it appears. We know that there are two main factors that are hormonal and genetics. In the hormonal uh, risk factors, uh, sorry, in the hormonal causes, I could cite a, diminish, uh, a drop of estrogen, a hormone that I will be talking about in a bit, a drop of progesterone, and changes in cortisol, melatonin, oxytocin, and thyroid hormones. In the hormonal causes, for example, we know that the placenta in which the, uh, the fetus is, is releasing what we call the placental corticotropin releasing hormone. And we know that that hormone, um, uh, if there are changes in it, it may, it may have a role in the develop, uh, development of depression. Now, genetics-wise, we know that our genes are the ones that code for uh, the, con uh, the conception of our body. So if we have, we know that uh, we have genes that code for a specific uh, region in our brain that's called the hippocampus. Yet, if we have an alteration or a variant in these genes, it will make that our hippocampus is more sensible to that drop of estrogen I was talking about, which could lead to even uh, to a more uh, acute risk of postpartum depression. Let's talk about the consequences. Okay, we have postpartum depression. What's the course of the illness? It's either a spontaneous resolution, which is good, but in most cases, it will progress in chronic depression for 30 to 50% of the times in a year. And we have 40 to 50% of recurrence of the depression. So we have many consequences, whether on the woman, as we just saw, but also on the fetus and the newborn. We will have problems of health and alimentation of the, uh, of the child. We will have abnormalities or uh, impairments in cognition in, uh, in psychomotor development. We will have uh, uh, dire consequences on breastfeeding and even on the, uh, on the new child's uh, health. A study was made comparing uh, the rates of vaccinations in uh, women that don't have depression and women with postpartum depression. And they noticed that women with that disease uh, did not really follow up the vaccination of their child so they could put their, ch their child's health at risk. And uh, of course, we could have marital problems. Now, one of the main uh, problems here, uh, one of the main uh, problems or uh, risks of postpartum depression is suicide. Yet we know that that rate is not really high. It's even lower than the general population of the mothers because here uh, the mother has a new responsibility and she wants to assume it. So even if she has those suicidal thoughts, she will rarely um, uh, commit it. So the diagnosis, the most common symptoms of postpartum depression are anxiety about the health of the infant, we're concerned about her, the, 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 the new mother will have concerns about her ability to take care of her infant. There will be a negative perception of the infant's uh, temperament and behavior, lack of interest in uh, the newborn's activities, and uh, she will not adhere to postnatal care in some situations or even use substances. But we have specific symptoms to look for. There is dysphoria, which is a state of unease uh, or dissatisfaction with life. The anhedonia that I was talking about, which is the diminishing of interest in activities that we once liked, worthlessness or excessive guilt, impaired concentration and decision-making, and suicidal ideations or behavior. These are the most specific symptoms of postpartum depression. And as I mentioned before, we should have five, five or more symptoms for more than two weeks. So if we have such a high prevalence of postpartum depression, and if we can treat it, we should screen it. The screening is pretty easy, actually. It could be made by any primary care clinician, as I mentioned before, to all women, and we should follow up the risk cases. It could even start by simple question. How are you feeling? What's your mood? Uh, do you still feel interest in things you like? Do you still enjoy the things you once liked? And this should be made during the visits of a uh, woman uh, to her OBGYN, for example, or even the pediatrician. Now, physicians developed what we call the, Ed what we call the Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale, or the EPDS. What's the EPDS? It's 10 questions that are scored by, uh, from zero to three that the woman should, um, should fill herself 
uh, depending on her mood in the past seven days. And we have a cutoff of 13. If it's more than 13, we should uh, do a, uh, uh, we should really dig into it and see if the woman is at risk or if she even has depression. Now, there are three main differential diagnoses of postpartum depression, normal postpartum changes, postpartum blues, and other psychiatric disorders. So when a woman just gave birth, it's very normal that she will sleep more, that she will have changes in appetite or even a drop in energy. So not every woman that just gave birth is depressed. The second differential diagnosis is actually the most important one. It's what, it's what we call postpartum blues. It's mild depressive symptoms, a bit of fatigue, a bit of insomnia, a small drop in, uh, in the appetite. But here it's self-limited. It usually starts three to five days after uh, giving birth. It will reach a peak within a few days, but in two weeks, it will be completely gone. It's self-limited. So here it's not pathological. It's not really normal, but it's not pathological. It's not an indication to treat. And unfortunate, unfortunately, we have a lot of misdiagnosis of postpartum blues uh, with people diagnosing it as depression, which is not the case. We also have other uh, psychiatric disorders, such as bipolar depression and other psych psychotic disorders. The last um, uh, pathology I'm going to be tackling is postpartum psychosis, which is a very taboo topic, but we're going to be talking about it. So what's psychosis? Psychosis is a disturbance in an individual's perception of reality, and it can be manifested through one or more of the following, delusions, hallucinations, thought disorganization, and disorganized behavior, as uh, MD Jennifer Payne defines it. Now, what's a delusion? A delusion is a fixed idea that's completely false, but that the person cannot shake off and is completely, um, and believes in it 100%. So for example, a delusion could be that, oh, the sky is blue today because God is sending me a message that I'm a prophet. This is a completely false idea, but even if we spend hours trying to explain that to the person, they will not believe us. They are completely, uh, uh, they completely believe that idea. A hallucination is a sensory experience without any stimuli. So uh, there are no olfactory stimuli, yet the person can smell something. There is not a tactile stimuli, yet the person feels someone touching them. We know that postpartum depression affects one to two per 1,000 women. So it's the rarest of the three. Yet there are risk factors like family history, personal history of uh, psychosis, bipolar, schizophrenia, and psychoaffective disorders, a first pregnancy, and the discontinu discontinuation of medication. The pathogenesis is not really known, but we know that there are genetic factors like a familiar history, rapid changes in hormones, and even a, uh, a overactivations of monocytes and macrophages, which are immune cells. What's the, uh, how does it happen? Usually it starts with an abnormal insomnia. The woman does not sleep well. Then start the hallucinations, the disorganization, a bizarre behavior and mood disorders. Here is the danger. Hallucinations can include auditory commands. The, the new mother will hear voices that are telling her to hurt her baby. But here, there is a risk of infanticide, but it's still really low, it's 4%. And this is why we, there should be a high surveillance. Then happen the delusions that I mentioned beforehand, and they depend on the mood of the mother. So for example, if she feels sad, she will think that her baby is possessed by a demon. And uh, of course, the, uh, the maternal infant relationship will be interfered, and the, uh, there is a very high risk of recurrence with over 50%. The diagnosis. There is not a pathology that's called postpartum psychosis. It's more of a specifier of a primary pathology, such as in the bipolar one disorder. And uh, uh, like we see it here, postpartum. And even in uh, depression, there is a specifier with psychotic features with post uh, peripartum onset. And usually postpartum psychosis is an entryway into bipolar disorder, which is very important for treatment because uh, each one has their own treatment. And if we treat uh, uh, and if we inverse the treatment, so if we treat a postpartum psych uh, a, a bipolar disorder as a postpartum psychosis, uh, it could aggravate the, uh, the person. I'm just going to cite the differential diagnosis, primary mood and psychotic disorders, mood disorders with psychotic features, substance use disorders, and psychosis due to medical condition. So if, if we just want to know what's the most important thing here, there are three main disorders for pregnant women in the perinatal period, which are depression, uh, anxiety disorders, the three that I mentioned, and uh, uh, postpartum psychosis. 
it's very important to research and prevent the risk of suicide, especially in depression, and infanticide, especially in psychosis. Postpartum blues is not pathological, it's not depression, it's not an indication for antidepressants. And we should always do what I call the uh, risk benefit balance to see if we should treat or not treat, knowing that the pathology in itself can have even more dire consequences than the treatment. These are the references that I use. Of course, I use the DSM-5 for the definition of the pathologies. Uh, thank you for your time. I know it's a very heavy topic. I tried to simplify it as much as possible, and I hope you enjoyed it. And if there are any questions, uh, maybe you could write it in the chat or open your mic. I will be waiting a bit for the uh, if there are questions. Thank you, Elisa, for resisting. Thank you. Thank you, Berman. It's very nice. I have a question. Yes, I yes. so. Of course. Kermel psychos fiat kun shi muakat bas khil hedel al period al. Yes, and. Badenat. Yes, and actually, most of the time, it's uh, what we call a brief psycho psychotic episode. And uh, uh, it, it's just uh, uh, momentary, but it will also have a risk of recurrence for later on. So this is why, again, we should treat. Uh, Sira is asking, are there any studies relating to the long-term effects of postpartum disorders? When does it stop being postpartum? Um, interesting question. As I said at the beginning, there are many definitions for postpartum that could uh, change from four weeks to even 12 months for postpartum depression. Uh, depending on the source, but uh, usually it, uh, it, it stops being postpartum depending on each pathology, so it, each pathology has its own definition. And usually, as I mentioned, for all of the pathologies, uh, if it starts during the pregnancy or during the perinatal period, it will go on uh, later on for, uh, the, uh, uh, for the person's uh, life. So if, uh, for example, a postpartum depression starts during pregnancy, uh, the woman is at very high risk of being depressed later on. Uh, Dr. Zena is asking, what about the stress and pregnancy during the pandemic? Is there any studies? Uh, I'm sure there are a lot of studies, and I know that a lot of doctors at my universities conducted uh, studies. Uh, honestly, I don't really have answers, but I'm really sure that the pandemic had a lot of consequences on uh, mothers' mental health, especially with marital discordances, uh, a rise in depression, etc. Uh, who decide the mother's case? Uh, I didn't really understand the question, uh, honestly. Uh, is part postpartum blues common to all women? I'm not going to say all women, but uh, a, a big uh, part of women can actually experience postpartum blues, but it's normal. In two weeks, it will stop. So this is why we should always do a follow-up with them. Uh, Maria is asking, I'm not sure if you've mentioned it already, but I heard that stress is passed on from parent to child. If the postpartum depression persists, is the offspring more prone to having depression? A big time, yes. Uh, studies even show that when uh, the, the woman is pregnant and there is a fight between her and her partner, uh, the child can actually hear that and be stressed in uh, utero which will uh, lead to a lot of manifestations and complications later on. And there are many studies that show that uh, depression uh, has a big genetic part and that uh, a history of uh, depression in uh, the family uh, is an important risk factor for depression later on. You're welcome, everyone. Who decides if the mother has a problem to treat? Interesting question. So here's the importance of follow-up. So uh, when a pregnant a person is going to her OBGYN, for example, this is why I, I mentioned the screening. This is why I mentioned the follow-ups. They should always ask these questions. They, they should always 
uh, this is why we have uh, questionnaires. This is why we have the EPDS, for example. We should always ask the, these questions. We should always score. We should always follow up. And if there is a problem, we should direct uh, to a specialist or not. And this is why I also mentioned that any primary care or healthcare practitioner should screen for, the, for these problems. So if, for example, a nurse noticed that a woman has uh, risk factors for any of the pathologies I mentioned, they should mention that they should screen for the pathology and treat accordingly. So it's always scores and, um, and you treat according to the score. Are there any other questions? We still have very two minutes. So if they treat before birth, these problems could be sort of prevented Yes, and not even could sort of, they could be prevented, uh, maybe not at 100%, but it's uh, it's definitely a huge drop in the risk of malformations, of complications, and uh, it will embatter the, the health of the, uh, the person who's pregnant. So yes. Okay, I think um, there are not any more questions. Would you say that medical bias plays a role in other diagnosing women? Yes, of course, yes. Uh, there is uh, overdiagnosis in some uh, countries and there is uh, underdiagnosing in others. In Lebanon, I would say we have an underdiagnosis, for example, of postpartum depression and postpartum psychosis because we don't even talk about it. So because we're uh, on the time limit, I would like to thank everyone. Thank you for your questions and thank you for attending. I hope you liked it. I hope it was interesting. Thank you. And uh, yes, have a great evening.